I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. Today is the third day in our novena to the most sacred heart of Jesus. Behold, said he, this heart which has so loved men. In the course of centuries, this charity having grown cold in the world, Jesus Christ resolved to make a new effusion of love in favor of his creatures. He manifested his heart overflowing with mercy. Behold, said he, this heart which has so loved men. He invited all, especially those souls paralyzed and frozen by neglect and indifference, to come to this furnace of love that they might find warmth and life. So the words of Mother Louise Margaret Claret de La Touche in her introduction to the Sacred Heart and the Priesthood, published by Tan Books. We have discussed how uh, God created all things as an act of love. We discussed uh, how uh, Jesus um, contains within himself, in, within himself all knowledge and that he... Uh, he waited until he was 30 years old to begin to manifest that knowledge to, uh, to humanity and to teach truth, for he is truth himself. Let us now continue um, our consideration of Jesus' teaching with the third and fourth lectures. These are both very short or shorter. So we'll, we'll put these two together in one video. And we'll look then at the difficulties of teaching. Now we consider that our Lord has revealed and he has given it to priests to be formed, to conform themselves to Jesus, and that they themselves would, would preach and teach without admixture of error, that they would trust in what the Lord has revealed and not uh, compromise that truth they would pass it on intact, which takes great trust. It takes great um, uh, focus and prayer and fidelity and obedience. Now let's look at the third lecture on Jesus' teaching. This is, also, this is continuing chapter 2, the third lecture, Difficulties of Teaching. In his public mission when teaching, Jesus met with many obstacles many difficulties, much suffering. He had infinite patience. He did not allow himself to be discouraged either by the coarseness of his hearers or by the slowness of comprehension or by their groundless objections. The criticisms, the insults, the double dealing of those whom he sought to instruct and enlighten could not succeed in wearying him. He never had his own glory in view. He did not seek human success. He sowed the divine seed in souls with full hands and with full heart, and he left to the spirit of love the care of making it germinate and of bringing it to maturity. Well, can't we learn something from that? He knew that by teaching his moral code, sweet it is true, but nevertheless austere, he would turn many away. He knew by his divine foreknowledge that many of those whom he was instructed would either allow the seeds of life to perish in themselves through negligence, or that they would even tear them out with their own hands. And nevertheless, he continued to give his divine lessons and to open to all the treasures of his wisdom. Contradictions, contempt, difficulties of all kinds are met with by the priest in his work. He must not let himself be cast down. Is not Jesus the divine master with him? Has he not the divine promises of Jesus to comfort and sustain him? Let him then take up the cross of his master and proceed with his work. But let him, not, but let him take care not to water down the gospel under pretext of reconciliation between the spirit of the world and the spirit of Christ. Let him take care not to make a Christianity of his own imagination in order to flatter human passions. The gospel truths of themselves will make their impression on souls. The priest has only to show them as they are, lighted up by divine reflections of the sweetness and mercy of the heart of Jesus. 
Yes, let him point out clearly the rights of God, his just, strong laws. Let him tell about his patience, his long-suffering, and the ineffable love of the Redeemer of souls. But let him never descend to base compromises, to worldly modes of action, and to, and to culpable seeking after personal success. Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be then prudent as serpents and simple as doves. These are the words which Jesus addresses to his apostles, to his priests, when sending them to announce the good news. And how marvelously he himself, our adorable master, has succeeded in uniting simplicity and prudence in his teaching. When he instructed souls individually, how prudently he acted. He advanced by degrees, having patience with their weakness, demanding from each only what he was able to give, waiting with infinite patience until the soul should open itself to grace and respond to the overtures of his mercy. He prepared minds slowly and gently before revealing to them the truth. He encouraged the faint-hearted he never forced his doctrine rudely on others. And in his public teaching, what prudence he displayed. Jesus always showed himself respectful to legitimate authority. The friend of peace he knew how to baffle by his wisdom the cunning attacks of his enemies. And after three years of preaching during which he had taught a doctrine and given laws completely opposed to those of the world, no witness was found who could give evidence against him when he was accused before the judges and princes. When he stigmatized vice or exposed errors to view, he never named the culprits. The culprits. What exquisite discretion he displayed in his conduct toward the adulterous woman. What reserve in his words when he has to instruct the common people in the most delicate precepts of morality when he reveals to souls the sanctity of the marriage bond or the divine charms of virginity. His prudence on this point is so great, his words are so chaste that the child of most innocent soul and most unconscious of evil can read and reread his gospel without anything troubling its mind or casting a shadow over it. Let the priest then, after the example of the master, combine prudence with simplicity in his teaching. If he wishes to do good in the midst of the corrupt world in which he lives, he must speak and act with divine wisdom. Let him be prudent in his public teaching. Let him be more apostle than controversialist. Let him be much more the dispenser of the gifts of God and minister of mercy than the violent reformer of the world. Hatred is only conquered by love. Sin was destroyed only by the blood of Jesus, who was meek and humble of heart. It is necessary at times, no doubt, to be strong, but prudence must regulate strength, must moderate the rigors of justice, must direct the, direct the action which punishes as well as the action which pardons. Let the priest be prudent in his private instruction. Let him study souls well before giving in directions. Let him be prudent when he is deciding their vocation, prudent when he is making them contract bonds which may determine their future and perhaps trouble their conscience. Let the priest be prudent above all in the instruction, instructions which he gives to young girls and women. They themselves are too often imprudent. How many families are unsettled? How many married couples have their harmony disturbed? How many souls given a wrong direction and sometimes driven away from the path of piety by counsel imprudently given, by words that are doubtless just and holy in their real sense, but capable of being misunderstood on account of their form. Let the priest of Jesus wrap himself in the mantle of prudence after the example of his divine model. He also is a teacher, a teacher of souls, he is a teacher of sanctity and virtue. Let his words then be an echo of the words of Jesus, which were all impregnated with wisdom, with moderation, 
and with truth. And the fourth lecture, teaching by example. Our adorable master did not confine himself to teaching by words, to teaching by public preaching and private instruction. He taught above all by example. He first did, says Holy Scripture, and then he taught. Is not the best lesson the lesson by example? What the ear cannot be always hearing, the eye can see. And is not the impression received through the eye the stronger and the more vivid? Is not the heart more easily inflamed by having seen than by having heard? Jesus knew this. That is why when he came to the teaching of the virtues, he commenced by practicing them all. He made them appear in himself so beautiful, so desirable, so fascinating, that hearts became inflamed with the desire of possessing them. And even now, is it not the recollection of the sublime virtues which he practiced on earth that moves us to imitate them? Is it not the thought of his divine patience that makes us patient? Of his humility that makes us accept humiliation? Is it not the example of his adorable purity and that of his virgin mother more than the few short words that he has said about it, which we find related in the gospel that causes the flower of virginity to bloom in all lands. Our poor nature has been so profoundly affected by original sin that the words of Jesus, the words of the Word incarnate, all powerful though they are, would not have been able perhaps to transform so promptly to transform souls so promptly if our Savior had not added to them his divine example. Jesus Christ himself first carried out all that he demanded of regenerated man in the way of virtue and sanctity. He carved out the way. He walked in it himself, drawing after him souls of goodwill. He placed himself as a model before humanity before this deformed and diseased humanity, which had long lost the divine resemblance, and he said to it, Look at me, and reproduce on the canvas of your soul my divine lineaments. Jesus washed this canvas in his blood and made it white. The church came and seeing man weak and incapable, maternally took his hand and guided the brush. And behold, soon copies of the divine model appeared. Some of them bore such a close resemblance, were so conformable to the original, that the Heavenly Father recognized in them his divine Son. They were the saints, formed after the example of Jesus, nourished by his word and living his life. As in the case of Jesus Christ, it is above all by his example that the, pri that the priest must teach. He ought, therefore, to be a living copy of Christ. He ought always to present to the world this divine image. Let him then offer in himself a finished model of virtue, a living and visible model, easy to imitate. Being a man weak like other men, although raised by grace above the miseries and baseness of the earth, he must, by his example, help other men, his brethren, to rise even to the height of Christ. Let your modesty, says the Apostle to the faithful, appear before all men. What then is modesty? It is the transparent veil which moderates the light of two sublime virtues, humility and purity, without hiding them. It is their most fragrant perfume, which insinuates itself into hearts, draws them, and transforms them. It is the most sweet odor of humility and purity. If the apostle recommended this modesty to the faithful, how much more should he demand it of priests? This divine virtue shone in the countenance and in the whole outward demeanor of Christ. It flowed from his profound humility and from his adorable purity. Let it also be the ornament of the priest, let it envelop him on every side. 
Let it mingle itself with all his actions. Let it be found in all his words. Let it accompany him in the exercise of his priestly duties. And he will be a living sermon of the truth and the virtues of Jesus. Everything in the priest should instruct. Everything should edify. Placed as a connecting link between Jesus and souls, he ought to lead them in his own person to his divine master and unite them to him. Souls should ascend to Jesus by means of the priest. The words of the priest, his actions, the purity, humility, and self-sacrifice of his life ought to be as powerful levels, ought to be as powerful levers to lift up souls as serene lights that guide them to God. And thus ends Lecture number four, teaching by example. Well, I'll have to say, <laughs> these mothers, or these, these words written by a nun, by a mother superior, by a mother, by a, or I'm not sure if, yes, a visitation nun. These words written by a visitation nun, a mother, a religious mother. And how a priest should be, are very humbling for me as a priest to be reading and to be reading to you. And she concludes this chapter 2 with a prayer. Let us pray to our Lord in the most sacred heart. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. O Christ, ineffable light, divine fire of uncreated truth, come and enlighten our minds. Thou art the word of the Father, the splendor of his glory, the light of the world. Come, and dispel the darkness which clouds our horizon. Thou dost always speak. Thou dost always instruct us in the person of priests. Let thy light come to us by thy priests. And as it is by their hands that we receive thy adorable body, may it also be from their lips that we receive thy truth. So strengthen them in the possession of justice and truth that they may never fail in thy way. Unite them so intimately to thee that they may think only thy thoughts, that they may teach only thy wisdom. Unite them so closely among themselves that they may be made strong against the assaults of sin. May their minds fill their minds with thy light and their hearts with thy chaste love, in order that in their turn they may enlighten all the souls that thou hast confided to them. Amen. In nomine Padris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Let us now turn to our Novena prayer for this third day of our Novena. And you can click on the link in the description below the video to pray along with me, the Novena prayer. And you may also click on the link in the description below the video for a copy of the Novena prayer from the Mother for Priests website. And you can find all sorts of other good materials there, including an apostolate for mothers to pray for priests. Well, please join me here tomorrow at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon for the fourth day of our, our novena to the most sacred heart of Jesus. And don't miss a day of prayer with us.